Um, today we have another exciting online program. Following our speaker's presentation at about 1 p.m., we will have a 15-minute Q&A. Um, please submit your questions via the chat function. And for those of you watching on Facebook, you can also submit questions via the comments. As a final reminder, please keep your audio and video turned off for the duration of the presentation and do not interrupt the speaker. And with that, I am pleased to introduce Craig Just. Dr. Just has served the College of Engineering at the University of Iowa since 1993. He earned a master's degree in chemistry from the U University of Northern Iowa in 1994 and a PhD in environmental engineering and science from the University of Iowa in 2001. He is an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and a research engineer at IIHR, the Hydro Science and Engineering Lab. Dr. Jess teaches principles of environmental engineering, fundamentals of environmental sampling and analysis, water quality and flow, and community-centered problem solving and design. Dr. Just has active research in Nicaragua and India focused on flooding and water quality. So please join me today in welcoming Craig Just. So let me stop sharing here and I will let you go ahead and take over. Sounds good here. Let me see if I can share my screen with any luck. Let's see what happens. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it looks like that might be it. Just okay. let me get it. I've got another computer here by my side that I can make sure it looks good. Let me switch views. Hey, that looks like about as good as it's going to get. Hey, thanks so much, uh, Megan, and everybody at the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council uh, planning team. Uh, great stuff. I really appreciate being back with the group. I see some uh, old friends uh, amongst those who are here today. Uh, wish I could see your mug shots. I, I might have to break the rule and hopefully during Q&A um, mug shots are allowed. I'd love to see a few folks here who are uh, who have zoomed in today to join us. Um, great stuff. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to let you know what we've been doing uh, in Nicaragua. And so we've got a a talk here focused on La Serena, Nicaragua. You already got some little tidbits about Nicaragua in the uh, lead up to the presentation, and I'll do my best uh, to add a few more meaningful points. Uh, what's shown here is uh, me. This actually is not La Serena here on the title slide. Uh, here's me with um, three of our College of Engineering students and a couple of staff members from an organization called uh, EOS International. Actually, one staff member and one community member there. And uh, it foreshadows uh, the work that we uh, ended up doing in La Serena, but it also shows you what one of these community water supplies might look like in a place uh, like uh, rural Nicaragua. You see these all around, concrete tanks up on a hillside. Water is either pumped up via groundwater or it is captured via rainwater coming you know, by gravity down the side of the mountain. And the water can be stored here um, for sure, but it needs to be treated. Uh, to meet uh, uh, custom in the United States and also as recognized by the World Health Organization. So that's really what this uh, presentation is all about. And so, um, you know, if you if you aren't aware, you know, we got some global waterborne illness issues. Um, I might refer to things uh, as WASH uh, during this talk, water, sanitation, and hygiene. And when you lack access to, to WASH resources, um, you know, nearly a million people die each year just because of that. And uh, we, you know, definitely want to do something about that. The United Nations uh, has their whole uh, list of things called the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And they want to ensure that safe drinking water resources are universal. And they've got a specific target related to water that by 2030, uh, we want to have uh, universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all. That's a pretty lofty goal given where uh, the status of things currently in the world. And it emphasizes pipe drinking water at home, which is particularly challenging in rural communities in developing countries. So you often see, you know, the photographs of, you know, young children fetching water in buckets or different things like that. The, the sustainable development goals are all about getting safe piped water into people's homes. Um, prior to that, uh, the uh, sustainable development goals are something called the, the Millennium Development Goals, which focused on improved water sources, which left many uh, without access to safe uh, and clean water. And so improved water sources are not guaranteed, uh, you know, access to safe water, and many are contaminated with fecal bacteria. 
So the, the new goals are you know, much more protective, uh, but again, much harder to achieve. Um, additionally, a lack of constant water access and intermittency in piped water supplies has been found to have adverse impacts on water quality. The same is true here in the United States. If, you, uh, if the water pressure in our distribution system goes down, many um, water systems have um, in infiltration issues that can contaminate that water. So that's a you know, universal concern. And in many cases, even with access to improved sources, storage or combined use of unimproved sources can still result in negative health outcomes. So there's a program out there called the Joint Monitoring Program. Um, we're lucky enough to know some folks who uh, work uh, in that program uh, here and uh, you know, colleagues of ours here at the University of Iowa. And, um, it's a collaboration between UNICEF and the World Health Organization and its goal is to monitor Sustainable Development Goal 6. And um, they came up with some new metrics uh, for the safety of drinking water related to that. And I definitely wanna make sure you guys are aware of what's in there. Uh, in addition to a water source being approved, it must also be quote unquote, accessible on premises, available when needed and free of contamination. Again, um, even in the United States increasingly, we're having a hard time doing this. Uh, certain parts of rural Iowa even, um, that's a really lofty goal. Um, so you, know, you can imagine do it in places that have never uh, done that before. Um, this uh, goal suggests the constant water supply that is carefully managed in a proper water quality is critical to improving health outcomes. And these, uh, the critical additions to this, this management or this measurement framework are well supported in literature. Positive public health outcomes and drinking water uh, interventions are largely reliant on constant availability, quality, location, and source type. So in Nicaragua, let's, uh, let's go there. Uh, so here we are. Here's a beautiful picture of the top of a water tank in rural Nicaragua. And uh, in, uh, as of 2015, uh, approximately 18% of the population lacked access to this improved drinking water source. And in rural communities, that gap goes up to almost uh, 40%. And so one of the interventions that EOS International has been all about are these, these chlorinators on top of these tanks. And so I'll talk a little bit more about them. But if you kind of look at the plumbing a little bit, the, the water is intercepted before it goes into those big concrete tanks. And part of the water flow goes through some tablets of chlorine to then add that chlorine to the water. That chlorine is a disinfectant. And then that will hopefully you know, improve that water quality kill bacteria and hopefully have a good public health outcome. And so an estimated 4,500 rural water systems uh, in Nicaragua um, lack this drinking water disinfection system at all, right? So many of these tanks just hold raw water. EOS International, as I mentioned, uh, has been installing and maintaining these chlorine tablet-based disinfection devices for gravity fed and for pump systems, by the way, groundwater systems, in rural communities uh, throughout Western Nicaragua since 2008. And they just recently joined uh, with uh, another organization in Honduras. And so collectively those, uh, the new EOS International organization serves 1300 communities uh, in rural parts of both of those countries. Um, among the community water systems monitored by the Nicaraguan Ministry of Public Health, EOS partner communities with chlorinators had a 61% lower incidence rate of acute diarrheal, uh, acute diarrheal disease. So there's the real you know, proof uh, you know, in the pudding uh, that you know, these things work, right? So chlorine works. We know that chlorine works and we use that extensively in the United States and it's used in you know, many, other, many other parts of the world um, as well. Um, but these chlorinators require monitoring and maintenance to avoid failure. So here in the US, you know, there's, there's a trained professional that chlorinates your water for you. Uh, if you're on, you know, a municipal water system, that water shows up at the tap and, you know, hopefully uh, in uh, all cases, certainly in most cases, that water is gonna be safe uh, for you and you just get to use it kind of carefree, right? Carefree. Well, you can imagine these rural systems though, they're, they're not carefree and there's some failure issues. And so one of the things that we've done is looked at the basic things that uh, led to a failure. So first of all, if there's no water, um, you know, this isn't gonna work. And by the way, this is EOS International data. So as they've gone around, they have these circuit riders that visit these uh, community systems, you know, at least once monthly, sometimes, you know, every other month, but most of the time, most of the, of the time, at least once monthly. And when something wasn't working, they, they took some notes and figured out what was going on. Well, obviously if there's no water present at all, 
you know, the pump is broken or it's the dry season, you know, whatever the case may be, um, you know, the chlorinator, uh, there's no operational issue with that that can deal with just no water present. That's a different thing to get fixed. 10% of the time, the chlorinator itself had something wrong with it and uh, needed to be uh, maintained. And so in these blue bars, we're calling these system failures, right? This is something that an engineer, you know, could maybe fix, right? Fix the pump or unplug the chlorinator or whatever the case may be. And again, collectively, you know, that adds up to about 37% of the issues. Now go down to here, these green bars are what we call behavioral uh, issues, right? And so many times this behavioral issue just means that the community isn't putting chlorine tablets in there like they should. It's just out of tablets. Nothing is broken uh, with respect to the overall system, but they just didn't put the tablets in. And sometimes that's a first time issue and with some training of the water committee or the you know, personnel, particularly in charge of putting chlorine in the system, you know, you can hopefully take care of the problem. But it's also got a repeat behavior issue, right? So it just means, wow, you know, we told you what the issue was and you still didn't take care of it. We came back later and it was still not working correctly, you know, as designed. And um, again, usually it's uh, for lack of chlorine tablets. And so that happens nearly 20% of the time. And then some communities, they get one of these things installed. They get all the training from EOS International, all that onboarding needed to run these systems well, hopefully. And then they just simply don't buy the chlorine um, and then, you know, don't put it in at all. And so, you know, that type of case is a, is a particular, you know, recalcitrant community that really needs some training and needs to kind of, you know, look at what they're doing. Um, with respect to these chlorinators. But add this up, this is 60% of the problem. And we, we, we train our engineers all the time to think about this, right? So here's the hard, you know, the hard engineering up here in the blue bars, but here's the soft, the soft side, right? This is the human uh, kind of aspects of that. And there's a variety of things, you know, we train our engineering students to, to think about or to consider when you need to overcome those behavioral barriers. And by the way, um, you know, not pointing the finger at people in rural Nicaragua. This is the exact same, I bet I'd have the exact same bar graph if people in rural Iowa had to chlorinate their water in the same way, right? <laughs> You'd have the exact same bar graph. So it, it's not really something that's uh, unique uh, uh, to this particular uh, part of the world. And so, um, you know, these circuit riders cannot always anticipate these uh, chlorine failures, right? These chlorinator failures. And so uh, here's Milton uh, from EOS International there uh, on the left. He's pulled out um, one of the chambers inside one of these chlorinators that holds the tablets themselves on the right. He is holding a, a tablet of solid uh, chlorine. Uh, it could be calcium hypochlorite. Um, there's some other versions of chlorine that are utilized as well. And so, you know, if the circuit rider was really good, you know, they could just kind of say, well, when's this thing going to break down or when's this community not going to add their tablets and I can go out there in advance and make sure that that gets done to make sure the community has safe waters. That just isn't a very, you know, viable model for um, many reasons. Um, and community training is labor intensive and may not guarantee that chlorinator performance. And so here um, is a meeting that I went to um, in a different part of Nicaragua, my last trip down there. Um, by the way, I was in no, no, uh, Nicaragua last in October, November of last year. Um, this community just got a new chlorinator um, on their water tank. And this is part of the training. Everyone gathers around, you know, this is, this is what we're gonna need to do. The community has to, you know, establish a fee structure so they can buy the chlorine tablets so they can pay the person who might otherwise maintain the system. And, you know, here we go. And so it takes a lot of work to do this. And if the information isn't communicated well, um, then you might have some lack of chlorine issues that again, the circuit rider is gonna have to you know, find out at some later time. And so we decided to investigate these issues in La Serena, Nicaragua with EOS uh, International. And so here we are, um, we've got a community member uh, here. This is Eleterio. Uh, he is paid by the community to maintain uh, the water system. And then here's Milton again uh, from EOS International. Here's our translator. And then there's that guy, here's our professor. And so here um, is uh, our, uh, the top of this water tank. I'll show you another picture of it here in a second. And you can see the water flowing in. This one is uh, gravity fed, uh, or excuse me, this is a pumped uh, water system from groundwater. And so they lift up this lid and under there you can see that pipe and then the water uh, goes down uh, into, the, into the tank. 
Um, and by the way, this is Carla. I just said our translator, she's a dear friend. Uh, so Carla is there too. And, um, and then just so you, uh, if you uh, have any familiarity with uh, Nicaragua and Honduras, here's La Serena right there. Here's Managua and down here. And then here's Tegucigalpa uh, once you cross the border into Honduras. And uh, so that's roughly uh, where this site is located. Um, engineering isn't always sexy. And so here's just a simple little water tank, right? So it's just a big, you know, square box uh, holds about 15,000 gallons of water. Uh, this is what it looked like, like when I took the picture in October. When I came back in November, they had uh, painted it uh, real nice. Uh, so the community came out and, and painted it up so it looked real sharp, uh, which is totally unnecessary, but that sort of stuff happens uh, quite frequently uh, when folks like me come to, come to visit and they want to impress. Um, at the system in La Serena, uh, here's Milton uh, looking at the, the, the tablet chamber there. By the way, one of the things I want you to notice is I think I've, I've shown you at least three tablet chambers um, in my picture so far, and they're all different, right? So they have these kind of these ad hoc designs. Uh, what's going on down here? There's a little slit down here, and then the chlorine tablets are like hockey pucks. They stack up inside here. And then the water, as it flows through this larger pipe system down here, some of that water then interacts with that tablet, dissolves some of the chlorine, and then uh, a fractional amount of that uh, water flow that goes through the chlorine tablet then ends up in the tank. We're really trying to aim for about, you know, three to four, you know, tops, uh, but maybe one to two milligrams per liter of chlorine in that finished water. And you can imagine, with no one there and kind of these ad hoc sort of systems, it's also quite difficult to achieve, you know, a consistent dose, even when things um, are working well. And so I definitely want to impress that upon you as you see these pictures. Uh, here's uh, that exact same system just zoomed out a little bit, right? So the main water flow comes in right over here. I hope you guys can all see uh, my little laser pointer. Yep, that looks like you can. I confirmed on my other computer. The main water comes through here, and almost all the water flow goes, goes through here, this bypass. But a small amount of water uh, goes through this piping and then through the chlorinator, which then also then dumps down into the tank. So hopefully that makes sense. And really the only way you have to control the dose of you know, the chlorine itself is this valve. And again, it's manual. Um, you're not there to deal with it. If the, it, this is a groundwater system, and so the flow rate is pretty consistent because a pump pumps it up there. But you can imagine that a gravity fed system that's receiving stream water uh, or you know, um, some sort of spring water that's uh, from a, a wellhead or that's been capped up in a mountain and then runs down by gravity, you're gonna have seasonably, uh, you know, seasonal flow variations in that that then this system you know, will not be able to account for very well. And so you know, there's, as good as these things are, there are definitely quite a few issues to be dealt with. And so one of the questions we have, you know, we're, we're researchers and, and we like to think about new things. And we're also quite, uh, what's the word, you know, also quite aware of the impact of, of technology on rural parts of the developing world to be able to, to change, right? So cell phones are everywhere. Um, they have 4G speeds, right? So 4G cellular speeds in much of Nicaragua, 3G, you know, everywhere. And so you're thinking, well, man, it, you know, if, if, if we can get that sort of technology in so many people's hands, is there a way that we could also kind of ramp up the technology in an appropriate way for these chlorination systems? And so our, our critical question is, you know, can online monitoring enable a water ambulance dispatch service that improves inline chlorinator performance? Now, this water ambulance concept um, is uh, kind of based on uh, an overall kind of system that I'll, I'll show you here. And so imagine uh, here, I got another chlorinator, right? Here it goes and we got some, you know, we're gonna put some sensors, right? We're gonna put some sensors in the tank that can measure uh, chlorine in, in, in some sort of a way. And then what if we could then take that data and use some sort of a, you know, a telemetry system, some sort of a, of a computerized system that can use a cellular modem to send data up here to the to the cloud, right, which is just a server somewhere, obviously, um, but can move data around, and you know maybe we can process that data in some way through you know some machine learning techniques um, or some just you know some math uh, that engineers know how to do, and then we could have a, an alert, right? So when the system isn't behaving, what if we what if we had an online system here that then said, hey, technician, 
chlorine is low in La Serena, or boy, it could come through on their cell phone. Hey, chlorine is low. And then you could dispatch the water ambulance to go fix the problem. Rather than having this, this, this circuit rider model where they, you know, they just show up once a month, you know, rain or shine, right? They don't, they don't have any idea whether the system is working well or not. Um, but yet they just show up once a month. Well, that's, that's expensive, right? That's, that's a lot of fuel. That's a lot of time. If you could dispatch um, technicians where they're needed and then leave these other communities where their systems are performing well based on what they're doing with the, the systems themselves, well then, you know, let those high performing communities and those high performing chlorinators, you know, just keep going on their own. Don't send a circuit writer out there and then focus on the ones that aren't performing as well. That's the type of model that we want to try to enable uh, in our work in Nicaragua, Honduras, and beyond. And so to explore this, um, you show up with an awesome student. Uh, so this is Megan Lindmark. Um, she, and here we are outside of the EOS, uh, uh, EOS International offices in Esteli, um, Nicaragua. And they also uh, rent out uh, an office space to Engineers Without Borders. Uh, there uh, as well. And so it's kind of one-stop shopping in that regard. Megan is a PhD student of mine. She's fluent in Spanish and she's just a brilliant uh, young uh, person. Uh, here she is getting ready to do our pilot scale or our pilot study, I would say, a deployment uh, in the water tank in La Serena. And so, you know, we got a, we got a box. It's got some computer stuff in there and, you know, some electronics and then we got some batteries and then there's going to be a solar panel and so on and so forth. And, and Megan runs the show, right? And so, you know, with people like that, odds are good things are going to happen for sure. And so here's Megan, uh, you know, having a bit of a community meeting at this particular time. Um, some members of the EOS International Board uh, were in country as well. And so we're showing them what's going on along with some of the locals. And so Megan's right here, um, you know, telling everybody what's going to happen. Um, all this stuff ends up getting uh, mounted inside this, this white metal box um, that's shown right here. And then this pole that kind of goes up off the, off the top of the slide, there's a solar panel mounted way up there. The only reason why we put it up so high is to try to avoid theft issues. Um, it could have been mounted down here uh, from an engineering standpoint, but from a social engineering standpoint, we put it up really high. And then if you notice, there's a little silver bar down here. That's where the electronics pass through to then put our sensors inside of the tank. Um, and so there's this little housing on top that houses the chlorinator itself, and then we get our sensors um, in there. Um, if you want to know kind of a, or if you want to know a little bit more detail about this, here's a kind of an engineered mock-up of the system. We actually have one of these built uh, here on campus so we can test it as well. Uh, in this particular system, the water comes in. We have a flow sensor um, on there so we can know how much flow is coming into the tank. Those are kind of expensive and we probably won't utilize those very, uh, in a very widespread manner. Um, you know, for future deployments. But again, when we're trying to do research all the way, you know, uh, from Nicaragua to the University of Iowa, we want to get some more information. So we spent a little bit of money and uh, a little bit of extra money and got a flow, can, uh, a flow meter. We then can have water go through uh, here, just like you saw in the other systems. This here um, is a control valve. Uh, if you, and we have this set up in our system here at the University of Iowa and in La Serena uh, for that matter, but we didn't enable it uh, in country in Nicaragua. What that does is, um, you know, we have computer uh, control in here, and every two minutes, it can measure the water quality uh, down here with these sensors that are down inside the water, and then make a decision on whether or not it needs more chlorine, or if it's got the right amount of chlorine, or if it needs less chlorine. And you can, you can adjust the chlorine level up and down autonomously by opening and closing this valve, if that makes any sense, right? So if this valve is closed, no water flow goes through the tablets, and then you can lower the chlorine dose. Uh, conversely, if the, the chlorine is too low, you can open this valve, and then you'll get more flow through here, obviously. You'll get the normal flow through there, and then you can dose in some chlorine. And so using this valved approach is one way that we can help to offset for those seasonable, uh, seasonal variations in flow. Um, but it's also complica uh, complicated and we have to kind of learn, you know, how this all behaves. So we're just using this particular feature on campus here right now. Inside here, you might see how the chlorine tablets would stack up and so on and so forth, right? We can also use some sensors to measure the water level, use an ultrasound uh, here inside the tank, 
and so on and so forth. So um, you kind of get the, the gist of it there. And so for our critical question, again, back to that. So can online monitoring enable a water ambulance dispatch service that improves inline chlorinator performance? Well, this is the kind of the backstory uh, for engineers. So here is uh, six months of data that came from La Serena. And you, you don't need to know all the details, um, but I, I will point a couple things out to you. First of all, if you're curious, this yellow line is something that's uh, from a sensor called uh, ORP, which is oxidation reduction potential. So if the oxidation potential is high, that means that you've got an oxidant like chlorine in the water, and then you know that it's gonna disinfect, right? So um, ORP, as we call it, oxidation reduction potential, is a really good measure of the amount of disinfectant that is in your water supply. So we're measuring that. And then um, the ORP signal varies with pH. And so we're also monitoring pH of the water system um, as well, just so we can compensate for the change in the ORP signal as a function of pH. And you might ask, well, why aren't you just measuring chlorine directly? Um, and the answer to that is there, there are sensors for that, um, but they're quite expensive and they're not very robust. Um, ORP and pH sensors are far less expensive and far more robust. And again, for this type of application, robustness is key. Um, and so we use these two um, uh, different water chemistry signals as surrogates then for the measurement of free chlorine in this particular case. And so here we uh, turned the system on in uh, roughly mid-November and then it ran and ran and ran and ran and ran and uh, certainly got some data all the way through June of this year uh, before we shut the system down after we'd pretty much learned um, everything that we could from it. And so again, this water ambulance dispatch service. And so I'll call your attention to some areas here, right? Where the ORP, right? Think about this. If um, ORP will go down like this right here when there might be a chlorine issue, right? So that's kind of your signal. And the key is like, you know, where's the threshold for that, right? Because we also don't want a system that kind of cries wolf, uh, you know, too frequently. And you're sending the water ambulance out at times when it doesn't need to go out. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So part of the research here is to interpret these signals and use computers to kind of make decisions on when to send out the water ambulance. And so we're working on that right now, but I will show you a case study real quick right here. Look at this data here. Um, and I hopefully have a little blow up of it here. And so this red line here uh, was one of our, um, was our current kind of threshold for ORP that if it dipped down below this line for a certain amount of time, that then uh, we would let the technician know what's going on. And so we did that right here um, in uh, May of this year. Or, and we said, wow, you know, all the way from here in Iowa, it looks like they're having a chlorination issue. And so we asked the EO staff to go out and look, and sure enough, the system was out of chlorine. That happened four times um, where we did that. We said, wow, it looks like you're out of chlorine and uh, you should go take a look. And so in my mind, um, it, it, it does work, uh, at least for this one case. Now, of course, one of the challenges is, uh, one of the challenges that, that we'll have is if we try to roll this out to 1,300 communities, you know, you can't have me in my living room looking on my phone, babysitting this stuff, and then texting people and telling them to go out and look at things. So that's where the kind of the informatics and, you know, and the computer-enabled sort of work on the back end. Um, needs to occur, but we're working on that. Megan is, she, she knows a lot and uh, Megan and others are gonna work on that problem too. But the point is um, we were able to detect uh, issues and what we found out by the way, is that the community regardless of, uh, first of all, the community uh, treasures their chlorine tablets. They do not want to waste them in any way. And so no matter what the case is, they would only put in one tablet at a time, even though the tablet chamber can hold two, three, or even four tablets, right? You can stack them up in there. Um, but regardless, they would only use one at a time. Okay, fine. If you go check it, you know, every other day, uh, Eleterio's house is, you know, like a five minute walk up, up the hill to the, to the tank. Um, he could go check that, right? And if it runs out, he could put in a new tablet. Well, it turns out that they it just kind of, you know, whatever the word is, uh, made a you know made a decision as a community that 
they would just change the tablet every three weeks, no matter what, right? So on a Monday, he would put in a new tablet and then three weeks uh, after that, on that follow, you know, the Monday three weeks from then, he would go put in a new tablet, even if it was empty when he showed up. And, you know, that's one of those community behavior issues, right? That, that we, we, that a circuit writer would have never found out necessarily. And that we want, that's the type of issue we want to avoid. And so then with some training, we would say, well, you know, it'd really be better to change, you know, to change the tablet in a way that you're never out of chlorine, right? That's how you're going to protect your community's health. Um, but again, um, you just never know what decisions folks are making unless you're getting this type of data to inform uh, kind of system operation, right? That's the way we're going to overcome that 60% of issues that are related to behaviors, human behaviors, and not the chlorinator um, itself. And so that's our main question. And, you know, this is what our data looks like. And this is an active area of research for uh, my student, Megan. And so, you know, whether or not that, um, you know, question can, can really be answered and whether or not the uh, functionality of these online or inline chlorinators can improve with this technology, you know, that's the, that's the cliffhanger. Uh, you'll have to wait for the next uh, presentation uh, for me to learn, or maybe even Megan can give it some time. That would be even better. Um, and so, you know, we're on it though. Um, we're going to look at it um, and see what we can learn. Um, we've uh, partnered with a uh, global uh, water company. They're a $15 billion company called Xylem uh, Water, and they have a distribution network, network all the way through Central uh, America. And so we're working with those distribution partners to you know, scale this up once we get the evidence uh, we need to see if it's gonna work. And by scale up, I mean you know, the next five communities where we would do this. At the same time, Xylem, uh, we're working with some of their product developers to make uh, components for all this that are actually at an affordable price point. Right now, many of these components are you know, priced um, with kind of more developed uh, world markets in mind. And they're also built for those markets too. Uh, Xylem has a what they call a base of the pyramid strategy, so base of the economic pyramid strategy, uh, where they hope to impact uh, 20 million uh, people in the next five years uh, with these types of solutions. And so we, we, we don't want to just do this in our university bubble. Uh, you know, it's not enough for me personally to, um, you know, educate M Megan. That'll make a huge impact on the world. That'll be a huge positive force. But we, it, th this thing needs to be designed in a way that we can at least have a shot, at least have a hope of being able to do um, a much greater number of deployments and get a system going. And so we're designing that aspect of the overall program as we are getting all this pilot data to inform how those sensors should work. Um, another thing that Xylem is doing is, you know, the sensors themselves need to become more affordable, more robust. Um, but again, we're working on all those things concurrently uh, with this such that we can uh, get these systems out where they need to be. Um, and then, you know, by way of thanks, you know, EOS International has been a great partner. Um, I didn't point him out. This is Wes Meyer. Uh, Wes, uh, Wesley is uh, in Iowa and he, is in, uh, he went to Iowa State University and um, got his degree in mechanical engineering back in about 2008, give or take. And then he did a Peace Corps deployment in Nicaragua. And then, you know, he, hey, He's been going there ever since, and they have an amazing uh, operation uh, in Nicaragua and now Honduras. And uh, Wes is, you know, really part of the energy that keeps all that going. And it's been a, a real pleasure uh, to work uh, with him and the entire uh, EOS uh, community on all this work. Um, so I got I'm that. So that's the end of my formal presentation. And if you guys have seen me uh, present at the uh, Iowa City Foreign Relations Council in the past, you know I like to keep my um, I don't know prepared remarks short because I love the the dialogue and questions. I do want to show you a couple extra pictures though. Um, there's Megan in particular. This one um, uh, with uh, Megan uh, in country uh, flexing. Uh, her muscles uh, and her, her smile um, as well. And so with that, uh, I'll pause and uh, take any questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I love the picture of Megan. Uh, as a fellow Megan, we, we rule. <laughs> um, 
So yes, yeah, so as you said, now we'll move on to the Q&A portion of the program. Um, so if you have questions for Craig, you can submit them in the chat. Um, and while we wait for questions to come in, I would just like to take a moment to remind everyone um, to check our website for the latest upstate updates on future programs. Um, and a quick sneak peek next week, we are going to hear from Chad Hart, who has also spoken to ICFRC before. Um, he is the Associate Professor of Economics and a Crop Markets Specialist at Iowa State University. And he is going to give us an update on COVID-19 and global agriculture. So be sure to tune in for that. Um, and then finally, I would like to remind everyone that we are still welcoming new members to ICFRC. So if you are interested in becoming a member or renewing a LAPS membership, please visit our website or email us for more information. So with that, we will move on to questions. Um, let me pull up. So how yeah. we'll go about oh, this. Oh, Megan, just one second. Um, yeah. Sorry, um, uh, with your speaker for next week, by the way, I should let you know that EOS International saw a quite a large uptick uh, in the context of COVID-19 in Nicaragua for the use of their chlorinators in more industrial settings where people who harvest uh, crops wanted to make sure that those crops were cleaned and disinfected in, in new ways to try to slow the spread of COVID-19. And so, um, so yeah, there's some interesting uh, perhaps parallels with your speaker next week in that regard too. Yeah, that's some great overlap that we should uh jump on chat in the <laughs> Q&A, right, right. ask him about water issues. Um, yeah, perfect, okay. Um, so usually how we'll go about this is um, people are sending them in the chat. You can probably see them as well. Um, I will just read the questions out loud for the benefit of anyone calling in um, and then open it up to you for however you'd like to answer. So I see one question from Mickey um, and she's asking, can you address any issues um, regarding cost to users, concerns regarding the flavor of chlorine, pesticide residues, degradation of quality as the pipes move further away in the community, et cetera? Yeah, great questions. And Mickey's, uh, if it's, I only know, well, I only know about two Mickey's, so I can only assume this is the one that's been uh, in my life for a long time. So hello, Mickey, uh, <laughs> and great, great questions. Um, so a couple things. Uh, Mickey might even know or might remember when, um, at a time when we were moving around in places like Haiti uh, together and whatnot, um, folks that sell, in fact, I've got them back here. Here, let me grab them, just a second. folks that uh, sell these pure packets, right? So this is like a drinking water treatment plant in a packet, right? So all the same, most of the same chemistry we'd use to treat drinking water as we pull it from the Iowa River, right? You're worried about pesticides and all that sort of stuff too. Well, you know, that we worry about that every day as environmental engineers for sure. Um, but, you know, this is a Procter & Gamble product at the time and we moved around Haiti um, looking at the use of this product and it tastes like chlorine, right? So when, when you use this uh, particular uh, product, the chlorine taste is much, what would the word be, um, stronger than we would have here in our finished water in the United States. And one of the ways that they got over that, um, or what, what they tried to get over that, is they marketed that as um, proof or evidence that that water that you're drinking is safe because you can taste the chlorine. That's your evidence. That's your evidence that that water is better than any other kind of water, um, which is a kind of a reverse. It's like, oh, this tastes, this tastes kind of funny. And you're like, no, that's your evidence that it's good water. <laughs> um, and I think only, you know, a company like P&G would come up with that sort of strategy. Um, you know, a big global company like that. I'm sure they had focus groups or whatever. And they said, hey, why don't we just tell them that's the evidence that it's great. And so try to flip the whole mentality. Um, with respect to pesticides, um, you know, this sort of a product, so a lot of the pesticides will stick uh, to some of the materials in here. There's like a clay product in here and sometimes it would absorb to that. And then as all the other particles in the water settle out, a lot of the pesticides, arsenic, for example, is removed really well by this product and that'll settle out. In the systems that we're talking about here in Nicaragua, um, that is a, that these systems don't have that protection. The water just goes into those tanks and currently for most of these systems, the only thing that happens is this chlorination feature or, or nothing at all, right? So 
Um, so it is very important to do source water protection and to also look at um, um, uh, ag practices in the area. So for example, we saw um, one of the, so actually the community meeting that I showed you uh, about midway through the presentation, that was in a community that actually had two water tanks. Um, one water tank was fed by mountain water, by gravity. The other tank was fed by groundwater with a pump. And they would choose kind of which one of those systems to use based on the type of ag practices that were going on in the mountains. So it's coffee country and, you know, tobacco and different things like that. And so depending on what was going on, you know, up the mountainside, sometimes that water would come in like with a kind of a brown color to it and certainly laden with some pesticides and herbicides and so on and so forth. So they, you know, they did their best for that. But, um, you know, to Mickey's point, you know, if you've got those things in there, chlorination isn't going to help you. And an, another concern of mine um, with that too is we are very particular here in the United States and, you know, in other developed countries to avoid the production of something called disinfection byproducts. So if you chlorinate water that has soil in it, you know, like cloudiness and, you know, soil and dirt, organic matter essentially, you can make things like chloroform, which is a known carcinogen, right? Quite a quite potent carcinogen and things called haloacetic acids and so on and so forth. And so that chlorine then makes cancerous chemicals if you um, add it to things with a high organic uh, content. So you can imagine to these systems, we, we don't necessarily want to add this chlorine to highly um, turbid, you know, water that has a lot of particulates in it. And so we do want to pick and choose, you know, where this, where this occurs. Um, and by the way, this intervention is already happening, right? So there's already, you know, just in the EOS uh, communities, 1300 of these out there. And I also have to think about ways, well, you know, if I could just improve the ones that are already there, even though that some of them may not be perfect for a variety of reasons, um, that, that usually results in a, in a net benefit to public health because, I mean, again, I don't want anybody to get cancer, but that might be a, you know, one in a million chance to die of cancer in the next 30 years versus um, if you don't have chlorine in there, you could die of bacterial contamination next week. And so there are these, there's this juggling act uh, in these places that are so resource constrained that is constantly at play. Anyway, long answer, um, but, but Mickey deserves the best. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a great answer. <laughs> Good. Um, so there's another question from Peter, um, and he's asking, some international water providers are not driven by anything close to what one would call altruism. Hmm. Um, is the firm you mentioned any different? <laughs> um, is the what going to be any different? Uh, the firm that you mentioned, I think oh. he was referring to EOS. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I know Peter too, and again, a lot of other folks. Nice to, nice to hear from you, Peter. Um, you know, so, well, okay, yeah, altruism. Um, you know, I took um, my representative from Procter & Gamble the task on that as well. You know, why should I work with, you know, you, you know, um, and, you know, what, where are your intentions? And, um, you know, I think we have, to, it, we have to play the game, though, right? Because uh, 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 2 billion people each day use a Procter & Gamble product, for example. And so their, their ability to distribute and get things out there is uh, unparalleled. You, you, that's transnational, right? You can't, you, you, there's not a lot of other ways to do that. Now, EOS is uh, international is on, on the other end of the spectrum. But anyway, to finish the Procter & Gamble story, you know, these packets uh, sold in Haiti for like less than a dime. Um, and, you know, I think that P&G had a business model where they, you know, they could, you know, these small entrepreneurs could turn a profit. And if they can get that safe water using that model to someone and P&G makes a little profit and these little businesses make a little profit, well, you know, what, who's got, who else is solving the problem in any other way? And so, you know, you're constantly playing that game in your mind, like kind of assessing, you know, where does this fall along these ethical lines? And, and yet at the same time, who's gonna, who's gonna get this stuff distributed um, for these things that actually work and don't work? EOS. Uh, EOS is, is kind of the, you know, the opposite of that in a way. They're a small organization. They have probably 20 in-country staff, and they might be up to maybe 30 or 40 now that they're blended with the staff in, in Honduras. Um, and, you know, they're a blend of for-profit and then, you know, uh, non-profit sort of mentalities. That are, they just had a fundraiser here last week, and, you know, as part of that, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, um, 
they're they're totally altruistic, but they they're they're business people. They know to keep their operations going, they have got to have a business model that generates the operational cash to keep moving. Otherwise, those 1,300 communities don't get served. And so, you know, to to answer your question, Peter, we have to constantly ask, you know, who. <laughs> You know, and call out right. If these big mega corporations uh, don't do their thing, um, then you know we we got to be really careful. I think the the trickier question are places that actually have a working municipal system, right? One where the community is paying for that as a municipal, you know, resource, and then a private firm comes in and essentially buys that resource or leases it long term, just you know, much like the University of Iowa has done with its public uh, public private partnership. You know, is that in the long-term best interest of a community that already has a resource like that? Um, and another listener indicated the firm, okay, well, in Xylem, so right, so same thing for Xylem. I just saw Peter's uh, comment pop up. Um, Xylem is the same thing. They're a huge company, but they have a huge distribution network. If I, if this, what, is, what if this works amazingly in, you know, in La Serena and the other, whatever, three, four communities I can go to personally in Nicaragua or Honduras, what if it works, what if it's amazing? What if it could be life changing if it got it in the hands of other people? Um, how would I do that, right? And so, um, you know, I, 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 I just wish that, you know, I just wish governments would pay for it. I absolutely, right, I'm in the public sector. That's what I, I wish would happen. I wish that was the way we could do it. But, you know, until that model exists, then, you know, I think we have to find the, the corporate entities um, that are gonna you know help us get this done for better or worse. I just don't know another way, um, especially to get at the scale that I'm talking about. Uh, that you know I want everybody in Nicaragua to have what they need, everybody in Honduras to have what they need. Well, that's thousands of communities, and I can't do that um, without some of these other entities. So um, skepticism needs to always be there, but at the same time, I I, I just I don't know what other model is going to get it done. Absolutely. Um, okay, so a question from Jim is, could Craig talk about the extent of community organization that takes place prior to beginning a project to address, to address costs, maintenance, proper use by users, and other things? Yeah, Jim Peterson, I presume I saw him on here, another mm -hmm. old friend. Um, hello, Jim. Um, so EO spends a lot of time on this, and in fact, they, um, you know, their circuit writers go and do um, all of that training, much like I do these days in rural Iowa, right? You've got rural Iowa communities that do not have the right pricing structure for their, their water resources and for the long-term, you know, uh, health uh, safety of those things. And so that's an ongoing thing we do here as well. EOS does a nice job up front of that, goes over um, the kind of the upfront capital costs, so to speak, of what the chlorinator itself is. And then the, the type of fee structure that then would be needed to sustain uh, the resource. And then every community has to have a water committee. Uh, typically about seven people in the community um, are part of a, a typical water committee. And then that committee essentially has taxing authority. And so they, they levy you know, taxes, um, you know, fees uh, to each community uh, member, or at least, house, at least each uh, household. That fee structure, you know, there is some, what's the word, there's some empathy built into that, you know, even in, you know, I, I think the factoid at the beginning of the presentation was 80% of people in Nicaragua live on less than two bucks a day. Um, I forget what the right answer was. It seems like a pretty high number, but um, anyway, it's a lot. And so even in kind of the poorest of the poor communities, there are still people who are the poorest in those communities. And so they, they do try to share the wealth a little bit, you know, for, for folks who can afford to pay a little bit more they can offset the cost for a family who might not be able to pay um, as much. Um, but all that has to be done up front. And then they have to then work with the EO staff then, right, to have that continual training to make sure the system keeps working. And then another thing that's interesting in this is that EOS also sells the tablets. So EOS has 50 distribution centers for tablets across Nicaragua. And then they know which communities, communities they sell to and so that's another way that they can monitor whether or not the community might be, you know, running their system correctly. <laughs> they know about how many tablets, you know, should be used per month or, you know, week or whatever the case may be. And if those sales aren't occurring, they'll send a text and say, you know, hey, are you getting your tablets someplace else? Or are you just not putting in the tablets that you should be putting in? And for, and there, there have been cases then where communities that are particularly recalcitrant 
who have essentially just, they've been okay. If you're not going to take care of the resource, if you're not going to use it properly, well, then we're going to, you know, drop you from the program. And if a community chooses to do that, you know, it's, it's, it is, it's their choice. And, um, you know, cause EOS can't, can't keep investing and in sending their circuit writers out for a community that just won't change their behavior. And so some of those decisions have been made in the past as well. Okay, um, Jim also added to his question that he is also wondering about personal hygiene education, like hand washing, for example, if any of that takes place with the training. Yeah, EOS um, does a variety of things. I would say their current program is very much on the drinking water side of things. Um, but they do talk about overall community health, but I would say um, probably not as much focus on hand washing um, as you might like. But I will say, though, that once you bring um, piped water closer to the household. So in La Serena, they have maybe, I don't know how many tap stands they have, um, probably under 30 uh, for a community of around um, 700, if I remember right, maybe only 500. Um, and so these tap stands, right? So those are just pipes that come out of the ground and they got a valve on top and you got to bring a bucket or some, something over there. But when you just bring water that much closer to the household, People, you know, there's soap all around. People are washing clothes. It's a very clean community, um, you know, by most standards. And so there's soap around. You bring that water close enough and then people kind of do pick that habit up a little bit more. So there's, there's definitely some conversation around that. Um, but, you know, we all know, I don't know, we all know. Um, I know and many other people know that hand washing, you can have a much greater impact on diarrheal disease, much like COVID, right? If you're going to do anything with COVID right now, it's wash your hands disinfect your hands all the time, all the time, all the time. Um, same thing for fecal contamination, right? And getting, you know, bacteria in your system. It's, 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 a uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going number two is really kind of the issue there and washing your hands um, and getting away from soil parasites. I see Hazel Seba on here too, you know, kids playing in the soil and, you know, getting things in their mouths, um, you know, create a whole uh, range of issues too. So that's part of it, um, but I see that much less. Um, but also, you know, I only hang out in Nicaragua with these guys, you know, a week at a time. And I'm really focused on our aspects of what we're doing. I don't always see all the other parts, but I do have pictures of the Smart Center. Um, I don't know, uh, you probably didn't see it, but Milton had a shirt on that said S-M-A-R-T, Smart Center. And in the Smart Center that um, uh, is in Nicaragua, they have all sorts of water technologies that you can see, but then also latrines, um, all sorts of different, um, uh, uh, you know, hand washing stations that you can all learn about there. So I know that's a big part of the overall EOS program. Okay, great. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, so Mickey has another question um, and she's asking, as you know, chlorine can be made with relatively simple and inexpensive, um, <laughs> I believe that's sodium chloride. Are any of you, or any of those you work with making their own chlorine to bring down the costs and concerns regarding tablet costs and monitoring? Yeah, I was just starting to look underneath my, um, I don't have my roadshow handy, I could go get you that. Actually, I probably do have one up here. Well, I don't see it. Um, I've got some of those chlorinators. My students built some of those, you know, years ago. and. Um, you know, they just run on a little six volt battery, a couple little electrodes and in, you put yeah, salt water in there, sodium chloride will do it. And then you can uh, make your own bleach. And then that's effective if you want to then um, in particular, um, what would the word be? Disinfect uh, like a 20 liter jug of water, right? So you went to the river or the stream. Um, hopefully the water didn't have too much, you know, solids in it. And then you put it in this bucket uh, some sort of a container. Hopefully it's got a, a lid and a spigot right on there so then it doesn't get recontaminated once you have the chlorine. And then if you could generate a little chlorine on site and then you know put the right amount in there, that's a, a very um, great way to generate liquid chlorine um, and, uh, and to use it. And so to answer Mickey's question, no, um, I haven't seen a lot of evidence of uh, people doing that um, in Nicaragua, but I also haven't been asking either. Many times I'll say though too, much like that, you almost need a, a group like an EOS International or some sort of community resource where there's someone making that at larger scales and then bottling it and then selling the bleach ready to go. I think the, I, I think the distribution model to actually have each community have their own little you know, bleach generator 
um, that's a struggle. And there's also some human behavioral things you got to deal with too, right? Um, so, um, you know, as promising as that is, you really do need to have someone there who knows how to run all that sort of stuff. So, and by, and by the way, solid tablet bleach, um, are, it's everywhere, right? It's all over Nicaragua. So in that case, there's really not a market incentive to generate your own from salt water because you could just take a little chunk of that tablet and throw it in there. And that would do the exact same thing. Um, and it's much more stable in that tablet form anyway and lasts, has a lot longer shelf life. So I, I just think that's in places where that's available, it's just a better way to go. Okay. Great question. Yeah, um, so I don't see any other questions just yet. So I'm gonna add one of my own if you don't mind. Um, sure. I'm kind of curious why your research ended up focusing on Nicaragua because I know that um, you know, the water crisis is, it's a global issue. So why Nicaragua? Um, well, I don't know that I focused there. I just told you that story today, um, but I work in India. Um, I've got a project going on in uh, India as well, um, but to your, and, and other places. So I've been in a lot of places. Uh, a lot of, okay. I've, I've worked in uh, Ghana, uh, in Africa. I've, I, anyway, so I've had students go all over the place, I guess. But at some point though, um, to make the impact that that you want, at least that I want, right? At, at my stage of my career and what I've done. So, you know, again, with Jim and Mickey and other people, I've learned a lot about the world through them. And, um, and now it's like, okay, you got to stay in one spot long enough to make an impact. And so when I met Wesley uh, from EOS International, you know, he's the tide of Nicaragua. Also at the time we had a professor in our program, uh, Pedro Alvarez from Nicaragua, and he still has family. I've met all of his family in Nicaragua uh, on a trip two years ago there as well. And so there were just some natural ties to our program in Nicaragua that kind of tugged at my heartstrings as well as my kind of my technical um, strings, whatever you want to call those. And so, um, and so Nicaragua just made sense uh, in that regard. And then I've had students do projects in uh, Honduras as well in the past. And so now that Honduras is uh, on the, you know, on our, on the horizon, I guess, since EOS has merged with a, a group there, uh, happy to work there too. Um, I just, you know, I've been to a lot of different places, but I feel very at home, uh, even with my, you know, terrible Spanish. Um, you know, I do make the locals laugh, uh, if nothing else. And um, I, I feel very at home in Nicaragua. I like, I like the scene. I like the people I've met there. And so that's another good reason to go too, because if you're going to, go for two, three weeks sometimes at a time and, and do work in these other countries. It better be a place that you feel really comfortable in. And, um, you know, Nicaragua is one of those places for me, um, particularly when I'm there with friends who can, you know, uh, you know, help things move along safely. It's, you know, the, there's some challenges there, um, you know, from the government and stuff like that right now. But, um, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's why I like to go there. I especially like your point about um, staying in one place long enough to be able to work on that one system and, and dig deep. I mean, that's, that's a really good point. Um, okay, so Peter, oh, go ahead, sorry. Well, I don't know, I saw his question, like, could I comment on the politics? Because, yeah. I, mean, I, can, I can comment on it. I mean, <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, so by the way, it, well, and, and much like here in the U.S., so the, 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 the politics in Managua, you know, the politics in Managua are very different than the politics in many of these rural areas. Um, but, you know, uh, and you had mentioned the, the, the Pan American Highway, I think, in your slideshow at the beginning. Um, you know, what, what, what has changed, um, what, what did change there kind of recently, you know, within the last year or so, when they had some demonstrations and, and a lot of that happens up in Leon. I've been to Leon as well. That's kind of the Iowa city of Nicaragua, as best I can tell. That's where the more liberal kind of professors are and the, and the protesters are. And, and so, um, and, uh, and, but uh, during the protest, they, you know, kind of crack down, right? It's, it's fascism there. I mean, that's just is what it is. And, and so then there are, um, you know, roadblocks at different, you know, there are check stations with, you know, armed police, and, you know, you got to stop and, and do things. And, um, you know, that, that's a little bit disconcerting. And when that starts to die down, though, and then again, we're moving around in country with people who are from Nicaragua, who are well respected, then it, then it feels, you know, better. And so there was a, you know, a bit of a travel lockdown there for a while, but now that's calmed down a bit. And it is what it is, though. I mean, you, you still need to do the work. 
and I don't get to pick the government, right? And, um, and so, you know, you just do your best to kind of carry on, which by the way, is another reason to also work in Honduras um, because the government's approach to supporting community water systems like uh, EOS International is uh, dealing with, it's a different, it's, it's much better. Um, and yet, you know, I don't want to leave Nicaragua behind, so to speak, but in the end, you know, you got to kind of diversify to some extent such that you can, you know, help some. And, uh, and so that's another good reason to be, you know, working in Honduras, because sometimes these, <laughs> these governments flip flop, you know, and new governments in and all of a sudden that's not a great country to go to, um, and then vice versa. So I, I think it's good to expand a little bit. Okay, great. Well, it's 1.15, so I think we'll conclude the program there. Um, thank you very much, Craig, for your presentation. I think it was very informative and everyone had really good questions, which is always a good sign. Um, so to wrap this up, um, Craig, I am honored to virtually present you with your, I believe, second oh, ICFRC coffee nice. mug. <laughs> um, we'll be getting that to you <laughs> soon. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for presenting to us today and thank you to everyone for coming and watching. Um, and with that, we're adjourned. Thank you. Bye. Nice job, Megan. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>